Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes for the research we do here. Each of the next 12 talks will come from one of the six new themes, two from each. For more info on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. So today we are delighted to welcome Professor Zoe Corsi. Zoe is not only my boss, she is a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, she's a fellow of Downing College, she's Professor of Experimental Psychology and of course as I mentioned she is the Biological Co-Director of Cambridge Neuroscience. So we're really happy that she has um, decided to come and speak to us today. So over to you Zoe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Devila. Um, uh, by no means I could say I'm your boss. <laughs> I'm stating this given that this is recorded. <laughs> it's wonderful to work with you, Devila, and, and wonderful to be part of Games Neuroscience. And thank you for inviting me today to um, talk to you a bit about uh, this kind of more translational arm of our work, which falls under the brains and machines theme uh, that Cambridge uh, Neuroscience has uh, uh, recently uh, developed. Um, so what I want to talk to you today is uh, about the power of algorithms and large-scale data when it comes to making um, early predictions about neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and I will be primarily focusing uh, on dementia. Um, I, I'm sure you all know, I don't need to say that uh, dementia is uh, uh, one of uh, the most challenging um, neurological conditions um, these days. Uh, uh, globally, about um, uh, 15 million people are already suffering from uh, dementia, and this is expected to uh, increase exponentially uh, over the next five years. Um, and only in the UK, um, the costs of uh, uh, social and healthcare uh, related to dementia um, are increasing rapidly to over uh, 25 billion. So um, in terms of health economics, uh, it's really uh, a disease uh, that needs immediate attention. And unfortunately, there are no currently disease modifying uh, treatments. Um, and uh, this um, uh, really uh, brings uh, several challenges in terms of how we diagnose the disease and how early we can diagnose uh, the disease uh, so that we can intervene as early as possible uh, when hopefully uh, treatments will have uh, the best possible effects. Um, so um, to get us started with the challenge that we have when we are trying to diagnose um, dementia, um, I've put together uh, this slide from recent work showing that one of the major challenges we have is misdiagnosis. Uh, currently, when we look at early stages uh, of dementia, for example, at the stages of mild cognitive impairment, uh, which in, in um, uh, several occasions is a precursor uh, of Alzheimer's disease, uh, we see a misclassification of patients, a misdiagnosis of about 20%. Now, this is really um, uh, a large proportion of patients that could be uh, misdiagnosed because of comorbidities to dementia. And these comorbidities could be, um, uh, for example, cardiovascular disease, or it could be other mental health disorders, for example, depression, anxiety, mood-related disorders. Um, just as an example, you know, an individual who uh, goes to their GP, uh, concerned because they experience memory problems, um, it's likely that they do not have dementia pathology, but maybe they are uh, suffering from mood-related disorders. Currently, it's really difficult to um, uh, discriminate these at early stages of the disease. And as a result, patients go uh, down very uh, rather invasive and costly pathways uh, of um, uh, diagnosis and eventually treatment. So this is a, a big challenge together with a second challenge, which is dementia uh, comprises of 
a large range of uh, subtypes. Um, and uh, different uh, dementia subtypes um, are associated with different um, survival rates. Uh, and that can make a huge difference if diagnosed uh, early, uh, patients and their carers and their families can be preparing, uh, can be taken into account and making decisions um, uh, based on potential uh, progression of the more uh, precise disease subtypes. So in the space of diagnosis and disease prognosis, it's really critical that we try to resolve these challenges uh, of uh, early um, precise diagnosis uh, that relate to uh, misclassification of patients, misdiagnosis, and also um, uh, disease subtypes. Um, so how can uh, algorithms and data help us here? Um, it's, it's clear that we are in need uh, of solutions that uh, can help uh, develop clinical decision support systems. And, and these solutions can take advantage from advances that currently we have with artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches, but also from large scale data uh, that we are uh, fast now moving into making open access. And this could be data from uh, research cohorts, uh, from uh, many international studies, but also uh, data, clinical data uh, from, uh, for example, uh, memory clinics um, uh, around the UK and around the world. Um, the challenge when we um, uh, try to develop approaches like this is that um, we need to make sure that our algorithms are transparent and they're interoperable. They don't work only on one specific sample. Um, that uh, they are precise in terms of the diagnosis and the patient stratification that they can deliver. Um, and uh, they can work on as uh, less invasive and low cost uh, data so that they can be uh, translated and, and applied into clinical settings, settings for making um, personalized um, decisions about uh, clinical pathways for individual patients. Um, so some of the challenges that we encounter when we look at large scale data and we try to uh, develop machine learning uh, approaches for mining this data, it's first that the data is very heterogeneous. It comes from populations that um, they may suffer uh, not only from uh, dementia pathology, but from other comorbidities. A lot of the clinical data is sparse, um, is incomplete and unlabeled, which makes it difficult for uh, the algorithms to um, deal with. So uh, more and more advanced um, developments um, uh, in terms of algorithms are needed. A lot of the scales we use to diagnose patients are um, not very sensitive, uh, while the more predictive data, biomarker data, is actually quite invasive to collect and quite costly uh, when we look into how um, uh, these methods can be integrated into uh, healthcare systems. Um, so today I'd like to focus uh, on Alzheimer's disease and keeping in mind all these challenges, um, I will try to tell you how we try to address these challenges in building algorithms um, uh, to do a specific task, which is uh, to look at early stages of uh, uh, dementia, at mild cognitive impairment, and try to separate individuals that um, uh, will remain stable versus individuals that they will progress. And what you see here is uh, the well-known Jack curves um, that show us that um, dementia is really a continuum um, uh, be uh, between uh, normal health uh, and uh, progression to disease. And there are different types of markers um, throughout this continuum uh, that can give us information about cognitive decline. Uh, and uh, initially, um, the markers we have um, uh, cannot be very highly predictive, only if they are very invasive. But actually, where we want to be is to be able to develop tools that allow us to um, predict uh, disease progression uh, very early on, uh, while not imposing on individual patients uh, very um, costly and very invasive measures. Ideally, where we would like to be is that uh, we develop tools that can be integrated into a health check 
the, the same way that we uh, are taking for cardiovascular disease in younger age groups, for example, uh, uh, people in their 40s, we could be taking for uh, our mental health, but our, our brain health um, uh, in terms of uh, potential um, uh, neurodegenerative disease and, and cognitive decline. Um, so to um, uh, tackle this question, um, what we did is we started uh, looking at large-scale data collected uh, in the US, um, and we use a cohort uh, known as ADNI uh, that has information from um, uh, about 1,000 individuals uh, and data collected uh, across many different modalities. And we concentrated um, uh, on cognitive tests and on MRI scans, looking here at only structural scans, the idea again being um, whether we can make uh, disease predictions early with uh, least invasive tests, like for example, a five minute uh, structural scan uh, that is typically uh, uh, done on the NHS uh, and uh, scores uh, on uh, cognitive scales. So just briefly to outline the approach we take, um, we um, uh, combine data from different modalities. We train the algorithms uh, using um, metric learning uh, classification algorithms in the space of the machine learning. And then from these algorithms, we interrogate them and we build uh, trajectory um, modeling approaches that allow us to uh, estimate how uh, quickly people uh, uh, progress uh, in terms of uh, um, cognitive decline. So this is the approach that we've taken, and I will take you step by step um, uh, on, on our journey. So the first thing we do is uh, we look, as I said, at structural scans, and we ask the question of, can we extract highly predictive uh, information uh, that relates to cognitive decline uh, from just a T1, from just a structural MRI scan? And what we did here is, uh, uh, we uh, looked at a large um, uh, sample uh, of individuals from ADNI uh, and uh, we, using partial least square regression, uh, we tested for clusters uh, um, of voxels uh, in the structural scans that relate uh, to a score called ADNI-MEM. And effectively, this is a composite score uh, from a different tasks that assess uh, memory ability in ADNI. Um, and what we saw, which was not surprising, but for us, it was uh, actually great evidence that uh, the methods we are using are picking out uh, biologically relevant features, is that um, the highly predictive clusters of voxels concentrate in hippocampal and entorhinal cortex regions that we know are heavily affected uh, by dementia uh, and in particular by Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that uh, this um, uh, cortical density in this region uh, uh, relates uh, strongly with uh, variance in admin mem scores. Um, uh, again, um, building confidence that what we are extracting here as features are clinically relevant, biologically relevant um, dimensions. Um, now, um, how do we know this is the case? Is uh, first we see that, as I said, the score that we extract from uh, the PLS regression in terms of cortical density relates first to cognitive um, uh, decline in terms of uh, uh, memory scores. But we, we did this in ADMI by actually uh, uh, testing on independent data uh, from the data that we used to extract um, uh, these clusters. But we also did this some data uh, that were given to us by John O'Brien from Cambridge from the Nimrod study. And uh, what you see here is um, what we do is we, we take these um, uh, T1 scans from uh, the patients in, in Nimrod um, and uh, we predict uh, how their um, cognitive, um, uh, their gray matter score uh, relates to actually a different uh, cognitive decline measure in this case, uh, ASR. So now that we know that we have uh, a biologically relevant feature uh, from uh, brain scans, we can put this information into an algorithm together with other information. And I'll show you what other features we use to train the algorithms. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the algorithms. The algorithms we use fall under um, a framework known as metric learning. 
Effectively, what these algorithms do is um, they look at prototypes uh, that represent different classes. Uh, and as they learn, uh, they learn to separate these prototypes uh, further apart. So as they get trained in more and more examples, they get to separate these prototypes far apart. Um, the algorithms are linear. They are very low parameters, uh, a very low number of parameters here, and they are uh, highly interpretable. I'll, I'll show you examples um, of this later. Um, and effectively, what we have here is we built uh, a prototype of stable health and a prototype of progressive um, disease. Uh, so here's the first model that we can um, build based on these algorithms. What we do in this model is uh, we uh, uh, give the model first the gray matter feature that we extracted that we know uh, is uh, highly predictive uh, of memory decline. We also give the model um, uh, data from uh, beta amyloid and APOE4. Um, and we ask the model based on this data to learn relationships between this data and classify MCI patients either as stable or as progressive. And we do this within a window of um, three years. So patients that are consistently given the diagnosis of MCI uh, within this window of three years uh, are labeled as stable, while patients that are uh, during the uh, period of three years switch from uh, MCI to Alzheimer's uh, are, are um, labeled as progressive. And as you can see here, uh, the model actually makes this quite fine discrimination uh, with sensitivity and specificity that is higher than 80%. Um, this is not a small achievement. Um, there are models out there that um, they will uh, have much higher accuracy, but primarily for um, uh, decisions that are uh, uh, more discrete, for example, uh, healthy versus uh, uh, Alzheimer's patients. So the, the dimension here that we are trying to discriminate is quite fine. Um, and the other uh, interesting thing about these models is, as I said, they are very transparent. As you can see here in this matrix, you can interrogate the tensors uh, of the algorithms and you can see uh, which are the features or which are the combination of features that contribute more to the algorithm's classification, to the algorithm's accuracy. Um, now, moving on from here, we also built uh, a model that was uh, uh, that learned these type of relationships uh, based only on cognitive data, no, no biomarker data, no biological data. And um, what we gave this model is uh, information about performance in memory tasks, in executive function tasks, and also uh, in um, uh, depression uh, scale. And as you can see, the model, uh, the two models, one we call biological based on biomarkers, the other one we call cognitive based on cognitive data, you see that the models actually predict um, equally well uh, this separation of classes between uh, stable versus progressive MCI, uh, suggesting that potentially at that level of uh, classification, patient classification, um, we could use uh, even cognitive data without any biomarkers and, and hopefully move um, towards making this patient um, pre, uh, diagnosis in, in less invasive, with less invasive data. Um, now, in the next step, um, we wanted to move away from these binary classifications um, and, and move away from simply uh, predicting labels and look at individual patient trajectories. So that, as I said, these models have uh, prototypes and we look at uh, the stable uh, health prototype. And what we do is through um, uh, a scalar projection uh, approach, we can estimate for uh, every patient how close they are to this stable health prototype uh, and how quickly they start moving away uh, from it if they are progressing um, towards Alzheimer's disease. And uh, what you see here is from um, this um, scalar projection uh, approach, we can extract a prognostic index, uh, which is multimodal because it's been generated by models that uh, learned uh, relationships between different data types, either uh, biomarker data or cognitive data. And uh, for each individual patient, uh, we now have a score 
uh, which describes how far they are from the stable prototype and how quickly they're moving away from the stable prototype. And what you see here is that uh, we have um, significant um, correlations between individual um, uh, prognostic scores and rate of cognitive decline. The higher uh, the score, the higher uh, um, uh, uh, the, the rate of um, uh, memory decline that we see. And you can see that actually in this case, the biological model uh, is actually more sensitive. So a model that includes information about biomarkers um, uh, is actually more sensitive in determining this individual uh, patient trajectories. Um, how can we validate this? We, we went to quite uh, a great extent uh, to validate this uh, trajectory modeling approach. Uh, so first we um, did this within ADNI um, with data that we did not use for training the model. So we kept independent data. Uh, and, and you can see that this uh, out of sample validation um, uh, we have the same relationships um, and, and this uh, multimodal prognostic score accounts for 46% of the variance uh, in rate of memory decline. Um, we also validate uh, this prognostic score against known biomarkers. Uh, so what you see here is that um, each patient's um, prognostic score that shows us how far uh, the patient is from the stable prototype. Um, relates to uh, beta amyloid. Uh, it also relates to medial temporal uh, lobe atrophy. Um, and uh, it uh, shows uh, differences uh, between uh, patients that have either negative or positive APOE4. So um, what this um, analysis tells us, what these results tell us is that the, this prognostic index, which is derived from the model, a model trained with different biomarkers and different cognitive data, is actually uh, biologically relevant. It relates to uh, biomarkers uh, of uh, dementia pathology. Now, the most interesting thing is what we can do with this score. This score now allows us to reclassify patients. So um, based on uh, the score that individuals have uh, that comes from the model, and independent of their clinical label, now we can assign patients into different classes uh, we can have patients that remain stable and patients that are, appear to be progressing either slowly or rapidly. And, and what you see here is that we can define based on, on this projection score uh, different cutoffs and reassign, reclassify the patients independent of their labels. And we can do this uh, for patients that um, uh, already have clinical labels of Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that in this graph, you see that patients that are already uh, labeled as Alzheimer's, they mostly fall between slowly and rapidly progressive. Um, but we can do it also at early stages of dementia. And what you see in this graph is that as we go earlier in the stage of dementia, some patients might remain stable um, and some will progress. And if we have patients at early stage of dementia that remain stable, maybe uh, these patients um, are suffering from comorbidities that can actually be treated for. Maybe they are suffering from mood-related disorders that there are uh, modifying treatments. Um, maybe uh, changes in their lifestyle could actually help. Um, and the most interesting result in this graph is at the bottom, the points that you see at the bottom come actually from pre-symptomatic cohorts. These are cohorts of individuals that have no symptoms. It's before any symptoms occur. And what you see is that uh, from uh, looking at uh, um, just a, a structural scan and cognitive data from these uh, patients, these individuals that don't even have symptoms, we can then uh, uh, classify them based on this prognostic score um, in, in different um, classes of stable versus slowly or even rapidly progressive um, in a way that we are making predictions about the future. And this is uh, really uh, uh, where the clinical utility uh, of these algorithms, of this approach uh, lies in reclassifying patients and in changing um, potentially the clinical care pathway. So um, when uh, individuals um, uh, come to the memory clinic because uh, of um, uh, problems with their memory, 
or even earlier on, uh, if we are able to incorporate uh, tools like this in health checks, um, we uh, don't necessarily need to assign uh, clinical labels, but we can uh, classify people in different clinical pathways that require different approach to diagnostics and treatment. Uh, patients that based on their algorithm-driven prognostic score are uh, identified as stable. Uh, they don't necessarily they need to uh, uh, go through the anxiety of six to 12 months uh, of follow-ups uh, until a final diagnosis is given. The algorithm is predicting that um, they will remain stable uh, and uh, they will not show uh, neurodegeneration. And therefore, uh, they can stay home, be given advice for changes in lifestyle, uh, potentially maybe refer to um, uh, um, for follow-ups um, in uh, related to mood-related dis disorders, but there are other pathways that they can follow. And this can reduce massively the anxiety of patients and their families and their carers. Now, we also, we could also have um, uh, the algorithm predicting um, uh, progression uh, into neurodegenerative disease. And in this case, we could classify the patients as slowly progressing or rapidly progressing, again, uh, making a big difference in how fast we act uh, in uh, whether patients need to be hospitalized or whether they can remain in the community with additional support. Um, so now to move on to uh, one additional um, uh, area that we can work with these algorithms is what I showed you so far uh, relates to how we predict cognitive decline. Uh, and that relates very much to symptoms that patients uh, uh, might be observing, reporting, and, and we are measuring uh, with cognitive tasks. Uh, but these algorithms can also help us um, uh, predict changes uh, in neurogenerative markers, uh, for example, in the accumulation of tau. And this could be more relevant for clinical trials. Uh, so the approach we've taken here is um, we look at the models we've already trained on ADMI uh, and uh, using the same approach of uh, trajectory modeling, we can now look at changes in tau accumulation and whether we can predict this over um, time. And again, here we work with ADMI data and longitudinal data uh, here is really important um, uh, so that we can see changes uh, over time and test whether the algorithms can predict changes in the rate of tau accumulation. And so what you see here is we can look at tau accumulation uh, in uh, different regions. Um, and uh, we extract for uh, the individuals the same prognostic uh, index from the models. Um, we've done the training of the models uh, on a separate cohort and what we test. We train the model on ADMI2 and we test on ADMI3. And we look at longitudinal changes in, in tau. And you see here examples of uh, temporal and parietal cortex tau accumulation. Um, and you see that this uh, prognostic index um, uh, can predict um, a future rate of uh, tau accumulation. And uh, we see actually that um, uh, early uh, AD uh, patients uh, accumulate uh, a, a global tau uh, 2.8 times faster than uh, patients that are classified as stable. Um, and that's based, the classification now is based on the pro prognostic index that we derive from the models. So it's more precise um, than clinical labels. Um, now, uh, more interesting, we can do the same again uh, as before with the uh, cognitive scores. We can do the same uh, with pre-symptomatic uh, cohorts. So we can look at individuals that have no symptoms. Um, and, and we have data from these individuals uh, in our cohorts and look at potential changes um, in uh, tower accumulation. Uh, and again, uh, we did this with ADMI, but we also used um, a, another cohort um, uh, from uh, Berkeley that uh, has 200 individuals and they are um, uh, tested exactly with the ADMI uh, battery, but they are all pre-symptomatic. And what you see is even in presymptomatic individuals, we can uh, predict future um, uh, tau accumulation 
um, uh, based on, on the multimodal prognostic uh, index that will derive uh, from the models. Um, so to summarize the, the clinical utility uh, of this approach of predicting uh, changes in biomarkers, for example, changes in the rate of um, tau accumulation um, could be very relevant for clinical trials. So uh, just to give you a couple of examples from the calculations we did, uh, we estimate um, a mean 35% reduction uh, in sample size needed to measure changes uh, in tau versus changes in cognition when we use the gold standard uh, PAC measures uh, for cognition. Uh, and also interestingly, we see that when we use this um, multimodal um, trajectory uh, score, prognostic score, um, we have 30% reduction in sample size uh, needed to measure uh, changes in tau uh, compared to when we use, for example, only a beta amyloid. So clearly multimodal data and the algorithms harnessing these interactive relationships between the data can make uh, a, a big difference in estimating longitudinal uh, changes in both uh, a cognitive decline, but also uh, a neurogenerative biomarkers such as uh, tau accumulation. And the clinical utility is that we can reshape uh, the clinical pathway, we can reclassify with more precision uh, patients um, and, and potentially um, make a difference into their diagnostic uh, follow-up and treatment pathway. But we can also, um, uh, uh, in the space of clinical trials, uh, strive for um, uh, better patient uh, uh, stratification, more precise patient stratification, and reduce sample size for um, clinical trials. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, I hope I've given you an example of uh, how actually quite uh, simple algorithms um, uh, can uh, be transparent and interoperable uh, and uh, can help us um, develop uh, prognostic uh, uh, trajectories for individual patients based on multimodal data. Uh, they help us with reducing patient uh, misclassification and having more precise stratification that is key for clinical pathways uh, and also for um, uh, 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 increasing the sensitivity and reducing potentially the costs uh, of clinical trials. Uh, in the future, what we strive for is to be able to integrate uh, these tools to, into healthcare systems, uh, into um, research and clinical uh, systems so that we can develop uh, decision support systems that they are uh, transparent, they are trustworthy, and they will make a difference in, in clinical uh, pathways and in drug discovery. Um, ideally, what we'd like to be able to build is systems that support clinicians uh, to assign the right patients at the right time uh, to the right diagnostic and treatment uh, pathways. Um, so I'd like to close um, by saying uh, we're not alone in this space. There is great interest. And if you'd like to uh, join us, uh, please let me know. Um, uh, Alzheimer's Research UK has uh, put together um, a really exciting new initiative uh, looking at how with data and algorithms we can uh, very early on detect uh, neurodegenerative diseases with high precision. Um, and here, I, uh, a new dimension uh, in this initiative is looking at digital data. Uh, this goes beyond um, uh, biomarkers and cognitive uh, tests like I showed you uh, and incorporates together uh, with biomarker and cognitive data, um, uh, data coming from uh, digital mobile technologies, for example, um, uh, a Fitbit um, and a smartwatch. Um, uh, it's a really exciting uh, initiative, um, uh, and uh, if, if it's successful, this could really uh, make a big difference um, at uh, early health sex uh, for neurodegenerative um, disease. Uh, so finally, I'd like to thank you for uh, staying tuned, um, and I thank all our collaborators, uh, both clinical collaborators uh, and uh, collaborators in computer science, engineering, uh, my lab, who's uh, been working tirelessly despite pandemics and all sorts of adversity uh, to uh, make all of this work um, lots of fun, and uh, all the um, uh, funders who uh, support us in this work, and uh, uh, 
of course, uh, Cambridge Neuroscience and Devila for um, making it all uh, possible in Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe, for that wonderful talk. Join us next week for the last in the current series when we welcome Stefano Placino. Stefano is currently a university reader in regenerative neuroimmunology and honorary consultant in neurology within the Department of Clinical Neurosciences here at Cambridge University. He has a strong interest in regenerative neuroimmunology and is going to deliver a talk entitled Regenerative Neuroimmunology, a Stem Cell Perspective. For more info on this seminar series and all things neuro-related in Cambridge, follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.